want to start, um, and I want you to think about your typical day. I want you to think about if you couldn't complete these daily life activities by yourself. Get dressed in the morning, have breakfast, get to work, complete work activities. How would that make you feel if you were unable to do that by yourself? What if this was your child's future? This is reality for a person with a disability. Until now. My name is Lisa Marie Clinton and I'm the founder and CEO of Avail Support. Avail is a mobile healthcare and educational solution that empowers people with cognitive related disabilities to live more independently. The why? is from 10 years experience in working in the area of disabilities, and um, the majority is an applied behavior analysis professional working with children with autism. And throughout my work, I met this little boy, Liam. Liam, handsome, blue-eyed boy, autism and nonverbal. And it was with one of these sessions that I see, see Liam play with his iPad as I was gathering pictorial prompts to help teach, and I questioned, what if I could get into that iPad? What if I could teach him without actually being there? And that afternoon, I skipped out of his house, and I said, okay, I'm on a mission. Can I fill this gap? I completed my master's dissertation to validate this idea. And in 2015, just before we released our prototype, Liam was diagnosed with an operable brain tumour. And a week before he passed away, I promised him that I would be as fearless as he was in life. And that he would be remembered. And he would be celebrated for the newfound independence that others like him have achieved. And so he is. We have a multidisciplinary team, myself, a CEO, Mary Cronin, a CTO, who has 20 years experience in the ed tech space, Bart Kane, financial director, and many others. Current supports are cost and time consuming. Lack progression and lack to show the effectiveness of programs. Although the biggest overhead is the one-to-one -one assistance that may be needed for someone with a disability. We need to enable people with disability through self-directed supports. <coughs> Government policies are enforcing the need for evidence and outcome-based supports. Although organizations struggle to provide this, struggle to be inclusive, struggle to achieve these outcomes while trying to manage overheads. 4% of the world's population require one-to-one -one assistance completing daily life activities. Did you know that only 16% of Americans with a disability have a job, compared to 65 of those without a disability? What role can technology play in this? Let me show you an example. This is our model. Evidence-based content to help someone across all domains. Step-by-step -step digital prompts of any given task. Allow repetition for learning. Assessment and monitoring from a distance. Reduction of prompts, challenging someone to be their best. Enabling someone to live independently. Anyone can use a veil um, who may require one-to-one -one support. So think of someone with autism, Down syndrome, learning difficulty, dementia, brain injury. While we have a broad market opportunity, our focus is on the workforce. Why? Because our content can, and software can be used by diverse businesses. Government policies are invested in this space. 
corporates are looking to enforce and implement their inclusion and diversity policy. Avail is like that one-to-one -one assistance, providing step-by-step -step instructions of life, of coping mechanisms, and behavior management. We sell both direct and indirect to our partner program. And we have multiple success stories. With our customers exceeding, um, customers and users exceeding their expectations. Some of the data that we're collecting, our users are mastering skills 50% faster than traditional based approaches. We have a powerful solution. We've gained traction. We have government funding in four countries. We're excelling um, our growth through investment. But most of all, the impact is with the user. They now have control of not alone their learning, but their life. Thank you. So I think we have about a minute and a half for questions. Can you just briefly describe how the platform works? You know, what sort of techniques are you using from a pedagogical standpoint and how, you know, how does it work? So it's an application on a web portal. Um, you can create the content on the solution or you can download pre-created content from a web portal. It works on and offline and it kind of monitors and, and I suppose assists the individual throughout their day. Thank you. Can you talk about one of your key customers and what the life cycle looks like to try to it's across kind of lot of all domains. We have special needs schools, we have adult services, independent living services, a lot in employment. Um, so it depends on where that individual is in their life, what they want to achieve. Um, you might have someone using it as a transition plan from school into independent living and into employment. So we work with, here in America, we have a number of special needs schools and we also have a uh, organization called Kencrest that supports 12,000 people with disability who after two weeks of seeing the impact and results came on board as a distributor. That's great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Devin Young. I am a uh, co-founder and president of Classcraft. Um, Classcraft is addressing student engagement in K-12. So uh, at the root of a lot of the main issues that uh, administrators are facing, what we see is that uh, if a student doesn't want to be in school, you have a hard time addressing things like attendance and dropout rates, academic performance, social emotional development. So um, has anybody heard of a game called Fortnite? Right, so uh, Fortnite generates things like this. This is an animated GIF. They asked us to give a PDF, so it's somewhat limited in its expression, but you have the kids sort of dancing, right? And uh, it's generated a lot of um, culture. It's a cultural phenomenon, essentially, for students, right? And so when you have um, a medium where students are engaging and it's creating culture outside of it, what it's really demonstrating, and what Fortnite's been particularly powerful at doing, is internalizing motivation, right? Games do that. So at Classcraft, we spent a lot of time thinking about how do we use gaming mechanics and principles and apply them to school. And so Classcraft is building an engagement management system. So what that is, is a system that allows uh, schools to address engagement at a systemic level. Um, and we're using that to change the experience of going to school over the course of the school year. So students are in teams, they have points, um, and they use uh, their character basically to follow them throughout the day as they're in school, and it fosters social emotional development, academic performance, um, and really drives engagement in the classroom. 
So um, here's a teacher in Chicago. She's teaching uh, a normal class. They're using textbooks. She's giving points and um, seeing real life observations in the classroom. And so those are put into the system. Um, here we have a, a fourth grade class where they're using a quiz uh, tool within Classcraft to do formative assessment. And the students are in teams. And we even have, this is an amazing video, but there's that PDF again, uh, schools who are using Classcraft to turn their school into Hogwarts. So giant teams across all the grades, dance out competitions in the gym, uh, and the culture in those schools is electric. And when you start going into those environments and you start looking at their outcomes, the outcomes follow along. So uh, we are five years old, we have five and a half million users, we're in 165 countries, we're in 11 languages, so we've been at this for a little while. We're in one in three US schools. Um, the system itself basically has a component where it's really rooted in classroom management and fostering non-cognitive skill development. Uh, students are in teams, so they're developing accountability towards one another. The game is impacting real life, so you get powers that like hand in homework late or ask questions on exams. Uh, and it's customizable, so teachers are adapting it for middle school, high school, uh, universities, and different subjects. Uh, we also have a personalized learning engine that we released 18 months ago that's been really successful. Uh, allows a teacher to take their lesson plan and turn it into an adventure map and starts branching the story uh, based on a student's level of mastery. Uh, we've had six million homework assignments handed in on this. Uh, 200,000 requests have been made in the last year and a half and we've integrated with Google Classroom and Discovery Education and we're starting to bring pa uh, partners content within the platform as well. Um, all that drives a lot of data. So because the students are uh, pushing accountability on the teacher, even though they have a uh, limited amount of time in the classroom, they're actually putting in the points. And that means that we're capturing about 50 million data points a month right now. Um, and it's making basically the invisible visible in the classroom. So systems that are uh, you know, on the computer and stuff are sort of showing usage uh, based on uh, students' uh, you know, online usage. We're capturing things that are happening in the classroom, and so we've built out essentially Google Analytics for SEL, non-cognitive skills. We've built out our own school climate index that's measuring school climate within a school in real time. And it's uh, really been powerful for administrators to start thinking about how they're gonna use student engagement to drive district initiatives. We are now in the process of kicking off an AI project in partnership with the University of Montreal, where we're gonna be using all that data to create real-time personalized PD for teachers based around a district's initiative. So the district comes, they say, this is what we're focusing on. We align the standards of that district to how Classcraft is managed, and then the system starts reporting on that and then starts nudging teachers along the way uh, over the course of the school year. Super exciting project. Um, we're partnering with the University of Montreal. They're dedicating a research lab to the project, HPHD students, and they're working in partnership with um, Yoshua Benjio, who's basically like the Lady Gaga of AI. Um, the idea is to start moving Classcraft into PD budgets, uh, where we see a real um, market opportunity. On average, uh, in the US, the spend is $660 per student on PD. Uh, right now, our TAM, we're selling at $5 a student. The idea is to move that up with a marketplace around the quests and publishers and uh, this PD piece to $30 a student and then actually uh, move that globally. Um, we don't see any competitors in the landscape. We see a lot of people that are doing things that are tangential, but nobody that's really addressing engagement at a systemic level. And so we're really excited about the white space, and it feels like an opportunity to partner with a lot of these folks. Um, we've got an awesome team. Uh, I run the company with my brother, who taught for 10 years. This came out of his classrooms. Um, we have Eric Davis, who heads up our learning, who built a school in Chicago, ran a curriculum company. Kimberly Harrington, who was uh, the commissioner of education in the state of New Jersey. Connie Yao, who ran the MacArthur Foundation. Uh, Jean Gadon, who is the creative director of Assassin's Creed as an advisor. Um, and Thierry Carcenti, who's heading up the AI stuff. And we're Canadian. So our burn is basically uh, about 150K a month, and we have 45 people on staff, so we're super lean and capital efficient. And uh, this is where we're heading in the next couple of years. So we're really excited about what's to come. And that's it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, I know that you characterize this as um, an engagement management system. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious to know, is this a singular platform? Because it seems like it's powering a lot of different use cases, right? So there's like one school that's using it to transform the school into Hogwarts. There's another that's using it like for formative assessments. Like, is it a singular platform that it enables all these different use cases? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're product people. So we made products for 10 years prior to this. And so um, basically the idea is that it's a toolbox 
for educators, right? And so there are all kinds of gaming principles that work together in harmony in this ecosystem, and then we work with educators to figure out how to adapt it to their unique situation. But yeah, all those tools are within Classcraft. I'm sorry, we have to stop there. I'm sorry, next. Sorry. Like 30 seconds for questions, I'm so sorry. No yeah. worries. Okay, thank you. I'm John Bauer. I'm the CEO of Flink Learning. And I'd like to talk with you today about literacy in the workforce. We have a surprising problem in the United States. Two thirds of jobs require reading above an eighth grade level. One third of our workforce can read above an eighth grade level. What that means is there are 60 million people in the United States who are either illiterate or have limited English and can't participate in the workforce in any useful or effective way. They can get entry-level jobs and they're stuck there for the rest of their lives. The adult basic ed services that states provide to solve this problem meet 2% of the demand. And that meeting is roughly $1,000 per student per year, which is inadequate. So we have an enormous implicit and pent-up demand for literacy services that we're not meeting. Flink Learning has developed practice to mastery software, which we offer to various organizations that are involved in adult literacy and adult education. And the software actually qualifies for government funding. Students who are using the software can see, can re, their, their organization can be reimbursed just as if they were receiving face-to-face -face instruction. So we're actually a revenue stream. That's the beginning. Then when you look forward, there's a market for mobile, there's markets for corporate, there's an international market. This is an enormous worldwide market for literacy nation, all, all over the world. There are com competitors in the market. Some of them are well established. But all, none of them have a set of solutions that really solve the problem, that provide team learning. So people preparing for the workforce learn to work together instead of just in competition with each other. That develop student agency and control. That provide, develop communication skills in real time while learning literacy skills. And then we provide a comprehensive literacy solution, which includes, of course, writing and texting. Uh, it's a formative assessment feedback system, and it's the lowest cost platform on the market. It costs us about a thousandth as much to build an activity as most of our competitors. We've been working in the market. We, last year, we ran 20 pilots just to test the UI, find out if adults engaged in this student-controlled approach to the literacy software, and they did. They found it extremely engaging, got very high, com high completion rates for those who used it. This year, we have pilots running measuring outcomes. We'll find out how those go, but we've early we expect that we're gonna show significant literacy growth against those students who don't have this kind of practice support. We're talking to publishers, we're negotiating for library sales, we have a partnership with Fathers in Education for the prison market, and we're looking at distribution. We have distribution agreements in K-12 around the concept of family literacy. You're teaching your children, you're teaching the parents of the children. So our distribution plan begins with partners and building marketing campaigns to support those partners. Because one of the tricky things about partnerships is that they don't do it alone. We, we have to support them. We'll do that in both the adult ed and then a little bit in the K-12 through our independent reps and especially go after the upside markets through consumer apps, job-specific vocabulary tools, and international products. Who are we? I'm John. I've built five companies in this space, including Lexia Learning and Soliloquy Learning, a board member of a number of relevant organizations. My partner, Peter, has been doing this for 40 years on an OEM basis. Some of his clients are little companies like IBM, Houghton Mifflin, Tom Snyder, Discovery, etc. We have key partners in the field. The state of Minnesota's adult basic education organization works with us on content and on compliance with standards. Uh, our partner, Laura Bresco, who built the company Progress Testing, works with us on marketing, 
and running campaigns. So where are we going from here? We're aligning our content with the new standards that have reached the market. We're building support for our distribution partners. We're developing our own di direct distribution to, to serve the upside market beyond adult basic ed. And we're creating these purpose specific products. So I'd appreciate any questions you have. Thank you. to scale with corporate customers? Sure. There are two aspects of training in corporations, but we, as we see it, the companies that are hiring near the entry level of the market, the Walmarts and Targets of the world, need, have a real need to increase the productivity and the upside for their employees. Churn is very expensive for them, so our intention is to go after them with a productivity-focused and a safety-focused pitch around the value of literacy, and especially in writing, so they can build communications within the organization. Um, two parts of the question. One, is this um, product on mobile yet? So can consumers use it on the phone? And the second part is, um, you mentioned that you have really high engagement, so I'm just wondering where it is about the UI and the product that really leads to that high engagement. Sure, so we're on mobile through the browser right now, and then we will switch, we'll put a wrapper around it so that it's a standalone app. And the issue, with, the key to the engagement turns out to be the student controlled and the team nature of the product. You've never seen people use software together, sitting in front of a screen or holding a, a tablet together, but that's how we work. And they work as a peer team, face-to-face in, -face in front of the screen, working to build them, set their skill level up. And they control the entire experience. We don't use algorithms. We provide feedback to students, formative feedback, so they make decisions about their own learning pathways. That drives engagement enormously. Other question? Okay, we're right on time. Thank you very much. is to uh, revolutionize how families find and enroll in pre-K through 12 schools. So we are a double-sided marketplace. We're in market, we're in revenue. We have multiple revenue sources and we're generating incredible data. So my journey started about 10 years ago. I have a background in finance and marketing. I got into the classroom through Teach for America. I was a teacher, master teacher, administrator. Uh, I joined New Schools for Phoenix Fellowship uh, became a charter school founder, uh, then later became a marketing director for a CMO, was recruited into another CMO as a marketing director. From there, I was recruited to uh, be a, a national marketing director, which means helping schools recruit and retain students, primarily through the use of data analytics. Um, and that's really where I got to see how much money was being spent in the marketing space for district schools, public schools, uh, public charter, and private schools. I then opened up my own consulting company, but quickly figured out that that does, doesn't scale, as the more clients we took on, um, the more overhead I had to take on myself. So I joined a regional incubator, Seed Spot, and they helped me build out my first product. Uh, we've been bootstrapped since day one. Uh, and was later uh, part of the 2017 uh, Learn Launch cohort. So the problem that we identified was that finding and enrolling in the ideal school for your child is really difficult now that they have, parents have a lot of options across the country. And for schools recruiting, retaining, and, and, and keeping just the students and making sure that they were the right fit was extremely difficult and there was a lot of money being spent there uh, to the tune of about uh, $500 per student just to recruit them. So the system is currently broken. We have a lot of indirect competitors, but there's no direct competitors. So there's ways of finding schools, but it's basically based on geolocation. So if you use a zip code, then it just shows you all the schools on these directory sites. Um, and then the other problem is even when you find, 
the right school, less than 10% of the schools across the country offer a way to enroll in those schools. And who is this affecting? Well, it's affecting the low-income communities uh, mostly, right? So in the low-income communities, 97% of families access, uh, access the internet via their mobile phone. So they can't print out these PDFs. They can't uh, have the ability to just simply go and walk to different schools or travel to different schools and see which one is gonna take their child before there's a wait list. This is affecting uh, 47 states currently with open enrollment, um, but it's also an international problem as we have uh, come to find. And it's currently impacting 53 million students across the US. So that's why we built Scola. Scola is the first and only platform that helps you find, it's like a match.com, uh, find and enroll in the right school. And so on the back end, it's kind of like a hub spot. And so for parents, we help them discover, connect, and enroll with the right schools based on their child's needs and interests, not their geolocation. For schools, we help them recruit, enroll, and retain students, which means that their budgets are now stable. And so we have really satisfied users. Um, with our users, we're targeting a market size of $19 billion, and that's only in the US. And that's only taken into account the marketing and communications budget. We are targeting a $2 billion market for, and these funds are used for students that are moving from one school to another. That does not include students looking for like kinder from preschool going to kinder or transition grades of like sixth grade going to seventh grade and uh, students moving into high school. These are just the natural 15% migration of students that are moving schools for other reasons. So we went to market last year in April. And so from April, just in the Phoenix area, uh, metro area, we were able to get 550 schools to use the product. We were uh, generated close to a quarter of a million dollars and uh, 140 of that was in SAS. So this year, the current traction has been that we raised our seed round we are, um, we generated 50K in revenue this month and we will be in six cities by March. This shows the current uh, phase of our growth um, and so we're uh, even expediting this process uh, based on uh, going into new markets and the reaction that we've had from parents and schools. We have a two week sales cycle with charter schools, two week uh, sales cycle with private schools, a three month uh, sales cycle with district schools and that's just because of bureaucracy that, um, that I can go into more detail if we need to. So the team that's leading the way, we actually have only like two full-time staff members. The rest of the folks are uh, partners in organizations. So we have a really low burn rate. Uh, we partner with organizations like the ACLU to create the first non-discriminatory online enrollment application and uh, lottery process for schools because there's currently no oversight for that. Um, and supported by uh, a lot of folks. Happy to take any questions. Can you talk a little bit about the attributes you use for the matching, like what type of interest you use, and, and how do you get that information from the schools? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So we pre-populate all the schools in the country with just some of the basic data. Uh, then we start mining every school for what programs they offer, but that's surface level. And so what we then did with the platform, we created a uh, crowdsourcing component because nowadays if you choose a school, you're choosing it based on last year's data, right? Um, and so with the crowdsourcing component, it can tell you um, with the parent input, because with every parent interaction, we gather this data, um, what that school is really good at in real time. And so the, the offerings and the products are always shifting um, and the program strengths as one year, a school could have a really good uh, football program, but if that football coach leaves, mm -hmm. then the program is dead, but that's not reflected until the following year. Um, so crowdsourcing component. How are you uh, driving awareness and traffic to your own site? <laughs> so uh, our marketing and, and business model is really interesting in that all we have to do is market to parents. And so we just drive people through Facebook and Instagram primarily. And my time is done. Thank you.
My name is Chris. I'm the CEO of Student Opportunity Center. We're helping universities create career-ready graduates through real-world learning experiences. There it is. So according to the U.S. Department of Labor Statistics, 48% of recent college graduates are unemployed or underemployed. We also know that the number one thing employers look for in the indicator of success after graduation is the student's participation in outside the class learning like internships, volunteering, and undergraduate research. However, despite the fact that this is the most important thing students need to be doing now, less than 15% of them end up doing any experiential learning each year. So higher education is in the transition to make experiential learning a central part of the student experience for every student, but they lack the infrastructure to actually do so effectively and efficiently at scale. So a quick definition of our terms here, uh, experiential learning is just higher ed's term for things like internships, volunteering, study abroad, any kind of outside the classroom, real world learning. So, problem for schools, they don't have the infrastructure to actually provide this at scale. So, the best way to think about SOC is like TripAdvisor Kayak for experiential learning. So, the first thing schools do is they centralize all their listings. So, students, faculty, and staff can just find them all in one place. They can then match students to the right opportunities at the right time. They can embed this directly into the curriculum to bridge what the students are doing in the classroom, what they're doing outside the classroom, and then track and verify the student participation. So on the higher ed side of the market, at $150,000 per institution, that's $2.2 billion. And on the employer side, that's $6.5 billion. And the market landscape, so this is an important uh, slide to understand. So the way the experiential learning market has developed has been around individual companies selling software to different departments around campus for different types of experiential learning. So all these uh, companies on the right here in the circle, so you have one group of companies that sell internship software to the Career Center, another group of companies that sell volunteering software to the volunteering office, study abroad to the study abroad office. So schools now say to us, we have 20 to 40 different systems, everybody kind of doing their own thing, so we need one central infrastructure to tie everything together, and that's what SOC is doing. Our go-to-market strategy is a land and expand. So we start with a $5,000 average annual pilot contract, then move up to an institution-wide $30,000 software package. And then uh, this year we're piloting with two institutions, a enterprise plus pay per opportunity model where universities um, actually asked us, hey, can we just pay you to bring in more opportunities into our network? Um, so uh, Florida International University is going to pay us uh, 15 to 20 dollars for each uh, non-STEM opportunity in Miami and Broward-Dade County that we can bring into their network. So we've been growing uh, between two to three x a year, and are currently at, ended last year at 410,000 bookings. Uh, next year, or this year now, we'll reach the million dollar mark. Then we're off to the races here. And we have, uh, we're currently a five person team, so we're uh, very lean right now. So two people on the engineering side, uh, one client success, and uh, two people on the sales side. Uh, Chris here on the bottom right, he has uh, 10 years uh, higher education sales experience. He was the top performing rep at a big company called uh, Parchment in higher ed. And we have some important uh, organizational partners and advisors, including the chancellor of the Pennsylvania system of higher ed and uh, early team member of Blackboard and some of the big higher ed organizations. So we are SOC and we are helping universities provide experiential learning for all their students. Um, going forward, do you see yourself being able to monetize on the employer side um, by providing them a pipeline of potential future employees? Uh, yeah, that's the opportunity on the uh, on the employer side. Uh, we've been almost exclusively focused on the university side just to capture that market share. Um, we think that's the most defensible moat. Whoever kind of gets hired first, there's a 90% renewal rate. That's going to be who who wins. Um, we spent about maybe 20 or 30 hours on doing exactly that uh, about a year and a half ago, and got four organizations to pay us to uh, fill specific positions based on the uh, uh, criteria the students have. Hey Chris, um, you were mentioning that experiences 
um, curated within SOC actually connect or integrate into a student's academic workflow mm -hmm. in, inside the classroom. Can you talk a little bit more about why you made that decision to integrate within their existing academic workflow instead of keeping it kind of separate? Yeah, uh, so this is um, a broader trend in higher education where, uh, so the institutions are getting pressure from all angles. They're getting it from the students who, you know, are asking, you know, what the heck it does what I'm learning in this class have to do with my job when I graduate? Parents are asking the same thing. Employers are saying, you know, your curriculum is not relevant to what I need for my applicants. Um, so uh, institutions are moving towards how do we embed how do we bridge the outside the class learning with the in class learning? So, for example, taking instead of just hey go do this internship and that's it, let's say it's a twelve week internship at you know Google, and it ties into your computer science three hundred one class. In the first week, you have to complete this series of assignments, post this reflection uh, to make it more clear to the students how what they're doing uh, in the class is relevant to what they're doing outside the class. Do you have any analysis yet to say that students who've done an experience on your platform? are more likely to get a their first job or get a job, or do you have any data around that yet? Um, so we don't have data parts. We haven't conducted uh, you know, uh, studies to, to show the efficacy of SOC specifically to SOC users for that, uh, but there's about 15 years of, of research coming from the American Association of Colleges and Universities, uh, NACE, um, almost all the major foundations. Uh, that show that participation in experiential learning um, affects all the outcomes that schools care about. So it affects uh, time to completion, uh, retention, and post-graduation success, which is kind of this nebulous uh, idea, which is getting a good job, getting a well-paying job, and actually just being happy after you graduate. I'm sure eventually you'll have data to say which type of experiences, whether it's a civic experience, whether it's an internship, um, kind of through your platform. Yeah. Who do you sell to? Oh, sorry, I have to. Universes. My apologies. <laughs> Provost. <Sorry. laughs> Great. Thank you very Cheers. much. Bob Gleason, I'm the executive chairman of Trinity, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I'm going to speak about a significant challenge facing college students uh, today, but before I do that, uh, let's look at this slide very briefly. Think about the lowest income quintile families in the country. Uh, in 1975, a third of the student of the children of those families were beginning college. Today, that number is two-thirds. That's a great thing. That's very good news. This is the bad news. It's getting ridiculously expensive to get that education. Uh, and in addition, in lockstep, the cost of textbooks, which is a smaller cost, understood, but the cost of textbooks have marched ahead lockstep with the cost of tuition. And that's a significant burden. We know the impact of that burden on students in terms of lower matriculation rates and student debt that they're carrying forward and the burden that that puts on them. So along the way, OER has been held out as uh, the wonderful opportunity that's going to reduce the cost of content. And uh, despite the enthusiasm for that, it's been slow to emerge. But someone has cracked the code, and that is OpenStax. OpenStax, a spin out of Rice University, has been working on curating a set of several dozen texts across a dozen major subject areas uh, for entry-level courses. And these are free. So you can get a PDF copy of these books, which are good books for free. Uh, the response of the market has been amazing. So this year, of the 12 to 13 million students who are in an entry-level course in the country, 2.2 million of them are using it in OpenStax text. That's over 15% adoption. So we are seeing OER gain traction in this particular market segment, which is a great, great news for students in terms of reducing cost. 
So before I move on to how we're going to play in that game, I want to give you a quick background on Trinity and our technology and our go-to-market. So we have a courseware platform. It's an all-in-one digital learning platform, a rich set of capabilities for students, and a rich set of tools for educators. Uh, content, collaboration, assessment, analytics, the two areas here I want to dwell on just a moment, live curation. Uh, which makes it very straightforward for information to be shared in repositories amongst, say, educators in the California Community College system that are teaching biology. A uh, very powerful capability there. And the other is significant back office capabilities that are important to our go-to-market with publishers. The other two areas that we're innovating in is the adoption of embedded AR. AR is a wonderful way to teach systems in STEM uh, disciplines, as you can imagine, seeing a respiratory system in three dimensions is a wonderful way to approach that. The other area that we're innovating is bringing video into the, the content library. So uh, many of you have children or have seen the idea of the flipped classroom where the student goes home at night, looks at Khan Academy videos, comes into the classroom and does their work. That's an important part of pedagogy for many educators today, and it needs to be sort supported in courseware platforms, and we do that. So how do we go to market? Two ways we go to market. We promote the platform to publishers, and we have a great success story here. HMH, in their international business, have rebranded our true learning platform as their global learning platform. Uh, we started that relationship several years ago. They started with a pilot this year, this academic year, over 125,000 students in over 25 countries are accessing the HMH K-12 content through their global learning platform. The other way we go to market is we publish very selectively. So we have three important criteria for bringing a course to market. One is higher ed because the sales model is more straightforward. Second is entry level courses because they're big markets. And the third and most important is distinctive change in pedagogy. That is happening in biology. If you are familiar with biology education, beginning five or six years ago, there was a big national movement around something called vision and change, which is a radical change in pedagogy in biology education from memorization to experiential learning with embedded math and analytics. So we worked with a set of uh, professors at Davidson who are leaders in this movement to bring to market integrating concepts in biology which is now used at over about 50 schools around the country. The most significant eff efficacy result of this from the uh, educator's point of view is that the number of students who go on to major in biology has more than doubled in a lot of the schools that are using the textbook, which is a great news for them. The result of our efforts to this point in three short years, we've uh, achieved a million dollar run rate. We've uh, proved product market fit, we've proved the scalability of the platform, being able to serve hundreds of thousands of students on the platform simultaneously. So now let's talk about how we play in the OpenStax uh, game and reduce the cost of textbooks for students. So as I said earlier, the problem is students are getting these free textbooks, but they're getting them the old way, like an old textbook. They're getting print paper versions of them. Maybe they're getting a lightweight ebook, but they're not getting the benefit of a courseware experience. And that's where we come in. We're partnering with OpenStax, and we're partnering with affordable learning system initiatives across the country. They're, these are emerging in almost every state and major university system across the country to work with them to bring these uh, solutions to market. And we have a very creative pricing model, so a student can get a free copy of the OpenStax text on our platform, uh, but if they want, if the educator wants to introduce collaboration, assessment, analytics, and those kind of things, there is a price point for that, uh, that capability. But the student can get the book, which is a far greater experience than the PDF, for free. And then we'll have an enterprise model as well, which will expand to analytics and other things across the university. Um, the market is substantial and growing. Uh, if you look downstream, we think this could be a $10 million copy market at $25 or $30 a piece, a quarter of a billion dollar market, and we think we can get a significant chunk of that market, and it will support the growth of the market, uh, the business in the years to come. 
Uh, the only thing I'll say at the end here is the team. Uh, what I can say is we have gray hair, we have red hair, and we have no hair. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Can I have another round of applause for our companies? Thank you so much. And thank you all for coming out. The judges are going to deliberate for the next 15 minutes, and then and then we will we will let you know who the finalist is. Thank you all. Thank you.